The little red light is on. All right. Number one. You know, most kids, you start thinking at an early age, as soon as you look in the sky at night and you see stars and you think, well, what would it be like to be up there? And no matter where we grow up, everybody looks up at the sky and says, what else is out there? I started saying I wanted to be an astronaut when I was five years old, according to my mom. It was the beginning of our astronauts making their way up to the moon. I remember coming back like, what is this? You know, how do I go do this? This looks like fun. I looked at what NASA was doing. I was like, I want to be an astronaut. So in a nutshell, that's kind of what happened. <laughs> I got into the Navy test pilot school and they started to apply to NASA. There's like 6,000 people that applied for, you know, 15 slots. And I interviewed four times over 12 years. I applied uh, multiple times over 13 years and interviewed five times before I was selected. Well, I did submit seven applications along the way, but I got rejected by NASA seven times, but the eighth time. And the fourth time, I got a phone call that said, if you're still interested in being an astronaut, we'd like you to come to Houston. Finally, it's launch day. Launching to space, of course, was a momentous experience. You see that this rocket is a living, breathing beast. The thing is alive, and it wants to go. It, it suddenly feels like it's real. First thing, you know, you're strapped into the space shuttle on the launch pad, and... And I can say, sitting in the rocket, getting ready for launch, you're anxious and you're excited. and waiting for countdown, uh, focusing and doing your checklist, focusing on your procedure. At the moment of launch, you're quite prepared. start to move and that constant smooth acceleration pulling you back in the seat and you feel like you're just in a car wreck because the solid rocket boosters light off and they give you a kick in the backside like you were just rear-ended at a stop sign literally there's just nothing subtle or nice about it there's the vibration the pressure and the acceleration the, the pressure in your seat I distinctly remember the point when I stopped and thought, I did it, I'm here. My goal was to be an astronaut and now I'm in space. Um, as a kid, you maybe you fantasize about spreading your arms and flying among the clouds and that kind of stuff. That's what we're doing. Floating is very cool. It, it's fun to watch new, I mean, new astronauts show up in space too, because they creep around. We we would joke like like space mice, very timid, very controlled. Being weightless the first few days is horrible. I mean, it's really neat to see something floating in front of you. It's really horrible to feel like you're going to throw up all the time. And then as you start to get into it, you start to realize that the human's an incredibly adaptive machine, and weightlessness is really really well suited for us. You know, pretty soon you're going into a hatchway and you come through and you kind of push off on both sides and you go zipping down the middle and you're turning right at the end. So you reach out, grab a handrail. And just... But it also brings out your inner five-year-old, or I say that it is the, the source of all stupid astronaut tricks. It's as fun as you think it would be, only better. I think I told my wife that I thought it was a burrito of awesomeness smothered in awesome sauce because I don't have a very big vocabulary so I tried to use the biggest most impactful words I could. 
Everybody's a superhero. You're not floating, you're flying. So the International Space Station being only 250 miles above Earth, we call it the kind of the proving ground for a lot of science. It is a national orbiting laboratory for the United States, and we do have hundreds of science experiments going on at any time. We're doing this amazing science up there. It is also absolutely the most wonderful observatory. And um, certainly for an Earth-facing observatory, the cupola module, this big bay window, you know, that we have facing Earth is the place to be. I got visited by three space shuttles. Se several of the crew members never looked outside the cupola before. I would bring them one at a time to the cupola, tell them to close their eyes, open up all the windows, the shutters on the windows, and then tell them to open up their eyes. Cerebrally, I knew that this was gonna be a life-changing experience. I knew that the view was gonna be amazing. And I will never forget that, that sight. Uh, the thin blue line of the atmosphere, the curve of the horizon, and it, that's when it became real, really at a gut level. I'm actually in space. We are on orbit. This is not a sin. This is my eyes looking through glass at Earth from space. It, it was uh, almost overwhelming. And so I think it's kind of overload for your brain and processing all of that at once because it just isn't used to that. You know, it's really hard to describe something like that because it's not just cerebral, it's, it's emotional, it's, it's kind of all encompassing. It was, my heart was racing, um, I, you couldn't wipe the smile off of my face. It was really amazing. I just was, you know, feeling something as I was staring at this view of the whole thing and um, it moved me to tears unknowingly. So. And that instant when you're overwhelmed with that vista, when your eyes see nothing but the beauty of the earth, every single crew member that I brought in there for that exposure cried. It is heart stopping. It is soul pounding. It is breathtaking. I mean, it was ridiculous. I, I'd never imagined in my entire life getting to see something that beautiful. It was so foreign for the human mind to look at that, to see the earth highlighted that way. Well, I don't think anything prepares you for how crystal clear it is. Uh, you know, I knew I knew the colors, but they just seemed different to me. They seemed more vibrant, more translucent. I've never seen those colors here on Earth. These pearlescent yellows and, and peaches that um, form when you're looking at a body of water with the sun angle, it's just amazing. I just took a pencil and I drew like 15 curved lines and I just wrote light blue, darker blue, pink, purple, dark purple, dark, dark purple, all the way down to the surface of the earth at sunset because the scale of looking at a sun refracting through the atmosphere, it blew me away, okay? And no picture captures that. There's no high, high, high enough dynamic range of a photo to capture what the human can see. How in the world am I gonna describe this? There's no, there's no words. There's no picture I could take to do it justice. There's no watercolors that I could um, put on paper to, to come close to the vividness, the ever-changing picture that I see staring at this planet. And I think that's the challenge of really trying to express just what ran through my mind when I'd look out there because the, my mind would just race. It's like a work of art out the window there, and it surprises you every time you look at it. One of the most impressive things was watching thunderstorms, you know, storm activity moving uh, around the planet. You can see its path propagating around, and you have these big flashes all over the place. You know, this one storm covering all the U.S. and lightning flashing off all over, nonstop. It's like watching neurons firing in a brain. I, you know, these tentacles of light that are just connecting and traveling. Yeah, it might be starting over Florida, but it's like moving across the ocean to Africa as far as you can see. And that was, I, I mean, I remember floating there just thinking about, oh my gosh, everything is connected. 
we got to see some, some interesting things up there. You know, one was Hurricane Dorian, a Category 5 hurricane with uh, you know, such a well-formed eye. When you look down at it, flying over in the station, it doesn't even look like it's moving, but you know the power that's at the center uh, of that storm and, and what havoc that that storm is wreaking on, on everybody on the ground. You look at it in terror, really, because you know all the people that are endangered underneath, um, but just the immensity of, of power that Mother Nature brings. A hurricane, a thunderstorm, everywhere you look, there is the environment doing something crazy. So we're coming up over Brazil, about to go across into the Atlantic Ocean. And looking out on the horizon, I saw, like, it looked kind of brown. I'd never seen that, really, from the space station. And I instantly, what did I think? Human interaction pollution, for sure. It's just awful looking. It's terrible. But as we went over the Atlantic, it kind of got thicker and thicker and thicker. It was a sandstorm in the Sahara Desert, blowing this huge plume of sand up into the atmosphere, crossing the Atlantic Ocean and coming down in Brazil. I mean, that is crazy. If that doesn't change the way you think about the planet, absolutely nothing will. What struck me was when we looked at natural disasters, uh, you see a flood, and you really can't pick out where they are on Earth. Uh, but when you see it from space, you realize that the effects of these natural disasters really hit everybody equally. And, and it really gives you this perspective that, you know, first of all, we're all in this together, uh, and that the world is very small. What has always struck me every time I went there is how beautiful the Earth is, how fragile it looks, how alive it obviously is with the clouds, the water. It's like it's breathing. When you first look at Earth, you may say, wow, that's a continent. And then you look at it again the next day and you say, wow, there are mountain ranges. And then you look at it again the next day and it's like, oh, I can see uh, synclines and anticlines in the geologic structure. You could see the, the Nile River and the Nile Delta so clearly the Red Sea. And for me, that was just amazing to look down. You could see the, the, the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea. And I was just thinking, this is where all this took place. The color palette is hard to compare. I mean, all these reds and oranges, and so the dunes all over in, in Central Africa and in Saudi Arabia, you have these so many different textures. And you can almost pick out where you are over the earth because Australia's tans are different than African tans. Every piece of the earth has its, uh, its own tone, uh, if you want. So you become very acquainted with the earth uh, as a, from a big picture uh, point of view. And you saw the, the, just the beauty of the, the landscape and, and the, you know, the mountains and the deserts. And you, you start to think of how they were formed. You realize just how special the place we are is. And you feel that connection. So when you look at the Earth from that vantage point, you, and I'm, I, know, I, I know others have said this, you don't see the borders. You, you don't see political borders. You hardly see um, geographical borders. You know, we're so used to looking at maps or globes in low Earth orbit, you don't see a globe. Um, and from no distance do you see the different, different colors for countries so that it makes them easy to distinguish. I was looking for all the little pink and green countries uh, when I was looking at, where's, where's Uganda? It's supposed to be pink on the, the atlas. You know, you don't see those geopolitical boundaries, all of the man-made boundaries that we've imposed upon ourselves as humans. You don't see any of that from space. It's just you and your team, and you're trying to make an impact on, on us evolving into something more. You forget about the politics. You forget about daily life uh, that that you know plagues us here on the ground. That that colors our perceptions um, because you're insulated from it. Then you just feel this sense of commonality more and something that that unites us all. And just that's that we're all human. Flying over Africa in the daytime with the intense sunlight so much of the time, you don't really see much detail. It's so bright. 
but at night when it's illuminated by starlight or moonlight, you really see a lot and uh, it's just fascinating. And you don't quite see the same texture, but you see mankind's influence on the planet. You get these beautiful, you know, twinkly city lights. And they represent human sprawl, which isn't necessarily bad, but it is incredibly beautiful from space. I love looking at the atmosphere at night when you have that air glow, and, and sometimes it was a bit green, and then you have the aurora dancing around. And we were flying into this astonishing aurora, this rippling, pulsing river of green that's down below us, the red that is stretching up to our altitude. It's like, you know, it was just breathtaking. Auroras, uh, the presence of humans at night, it's obvious with the lights. But it's the death around the Earth that's startling. How this beautiful, shining oasis of life is there naked in the middle of pitch black death, the vacuum of space. Definitely look up and, and see the stars like you have never seen them before. I mean, the Milky Way is just stunning. There's many things in the cosmos to gaze at it. For example, the, the Magellanic Clouds, those show up really bright and vivid because you don't have atmospheric scattering. You can see Andromeda, the spiral galaxy of Andromeda. Of course, the lights don't flicker. They're steady because they're not coming through the dust and, and uh, coming through the atmosphere. And then you, as you really adjust, you start to sense the very subtle colors that are in the stars, a little bit of reddish, a little bit of bluish, blue-white. Just all the colors in the light come out, you know, in that depth of space as well. I could all of a sudden detect depth. Now, I couldn't tell you how much, but it's light years, right? And, and it's like, whoa, I can somehow tell that that star is closer than that star. And that was something that knocked my socks off. And I thought, nobody told me about this. I don't think I had thought before going up there about how many stars you see, you know, the density of stars. You see so many stars, it becomes hard to pick out constellations. People ask if there's aliens, and I'm like, of course, there are aliens. Look at all those stars. There's got to be. It's just so vast and infinite. Um, I don't know what else to say about that. I remember using like the 800 millimeter lens and just really zooming into places. And you know, you still can't see people walking around or anything, but you see impacts of things. And you realize that a lot of times we have to pull way back. You know, you have to pull way back and see the big picture of it. You realize just how small you are because you at times struggle to find evidence of human activity down there. You can go over massive swaths of the earth and not see a trace of any human impact. Or you can go over other swaths and you can see dramatic impact. Frequently in the summertime, there's a lot of fires in Africa. You see all of those plumes of smoke heading west across the Atlantic. You fly over South America and you see, you know, widespread deforestation and you know the impact that that has, you can almost get a, a sense of the balance of you know, how, how, how nature is trying to balance all the inputs and the outputs and, and have a stable system. And, and you can see our effect on it. To me, it started to make me understand that everything is connected. What is happening in the ocean over here can affect what is happening on land over here. It's just all one being, <laughs> thing, and it's all interconnected.
you can see combat. I mean, we were very, two, two countries were at war and you could very easily see missiles being shot. They just look like little tiny traces of light. You, you can see all that stuff. So to me, I didn't see one unified human civilization. You certainly see one unified planet cruising around the sun and that is a unique perspective. But during my, uh, my time on the space station, I had the chance to do a spacewalk, put on a spacesuit and go outside. And that's a very special experience for, for any astronaut. You're inside the space station or the shuttle, and now you put on a suit and go outside. It's like th there is an elevation in risk when you do that, but it is a bit thrilling Spacewalks always seem to be very uh, busy and task-focused events where I got to do this and I got to move over here and do this. And... and then you just have to not think about where you are. Just concentrate on getting the job done, what's the big picture. Rarely did you have a minute where you could just say, ah, just take a minute and enjoy the view. But, you know, there were those minutes every once in a while. And the view from outside the spacecraft, you know, with that full panoramic uh, vision through your helmet visor, it was just incredible. It's a very disturbing view, looking down about 240 miles at the Earth, going by at you know, 17,000 miles an hour. It's like, oh boy. I just watched the Earth going by below me, and I only had this, you know, thin visor separating uh, me from a very unsurvivable atmosphere and my feet were dangling. I remember, you know, not just through my visor, but looking down and just, you just see feet and then earth, you know, and, and, and you're holding onto the space station. And it, I mean, it was just incredible. Everything looked so large. The colors are even more vibrant. And I think also just mentally, psychologically realizing that, you know, there is nothing between the, the vacuum of space except for this spacesuit and your visor. I remember thinking that coming out, like that the world would just open up around me. And, um, and the view for some reason seems bigger than what you have when you're looking through the windows of a, a spacecraft. I mean, it wasn't like Earth is over there. It wasn't small. It was like it took up your entire, you know, visor and all as far as you could see and just watching it come over Earth and just how large Earth was compared to, was uh, from our perspective. But oh my gosh, you, you see Earth and you see your glowing station around you and uh, you realize, okay, I gotta stop looking at this stuff because it becomes a distraction to the work that you're doing out there. So I always kid those astronauts that don't do the spacewalks, you know, I said, the view from inside here through this flat window is pretty good, you know? The view from outside is just amazing. And, and the great thing about living on Space Station, I loved every minute of it. I, I had a countdown going, but it was, oh no, I only have two months left. All right. All right, one last look at the Earth. This is some good news. The Earth is still beautiful. An Earth in crisis is still an Earth worth returning to. Life seems extremely busy and, and you, you know, the days start flying by and before you know it, it's over. As it drew to a close, I, I think I was more feeling as though did you do enough to capture this so that you can share it uh, when you get home? And so that you can light those fires in people as you go around and talk about this and, and try to, you know, ignite the passion in, in kids just like I had ignited for me as a kid.
and you're back on the ground and uh, and somebody else is doing the job up there now it, it makes you feel like you know this is a really big thing that we're a part of and uh, just you know I'm fortunate to play my part it is the fact that going to space and seeing the earth from that vantage point has a life-changing effect on on most of us it takes a lot of energy to describe it what, what it's like up there because there's so much of your emotion built into it. I think the best way to describe it is that your viewpoint changes, that you can look at the same thing, but it changes the lens through which you see it. And that, that acute realized, concrete realization that uh, we belong to Earth and not vice versa, it's, it's kind of a mental shift to see that we just nowhere else we could go. I think if you're not a conservationist before you go to space, you're at least partly a conservationist when you come back. Because when you see how thin that atmosphere is, that protective layer that we have here, you think, wow, we really have to take care of this because it does look so fragile from space. I think I felt that need to protect it even before leaving it, but it definitely does resonate even more loudly now, having seen it myself and, and how stunning and beautiful it is. All of those unique ecosystems, everything's connected, the land masses and the ocean masses and the atmosphere, and we are all in it together. We are all down there. And so I think that's the most important thing that I would encourage people to think about that perspective. I think you get a sense of, um, uh, preservation of, of um, I don't want this to go away and I don't want to be the only one to see this. And there are so many people that need to see it, but only a handful will in this lifetime. You know, I, I remember coming back from all my missions with that sense that, you know, we're all connected, we're all people. And I thought about why is it that we do have conflicts? What is it that separates us from one another? If you could get 7 billion people to go up there and look down, for just even 30 seconds. You would change them, all of them, forever. They wouldn't all come back and be friends. They wouldn't all come back and tear down border walls and things like that. But you would change all of them, and you would change them all for the better, and they would have a different view of the planet. I think if people that can lift their eyes up and, and see the bigger picture, yeah. whether it's from orbit or even just understanding the different sides, maybe spending more time listening you know, rather than shouting, and that's what I want people to find. I absolutely found that in the experience I had in space, in this, the simple facts of us living on a planet and all being Earthlings and the only border that matters is that thin blue line.